on today's show, how advisors can profit by understanding the history of the life settlement market. Part two of this week's series on life insurance settlement update for 2014. With president and CEO of the Life Insurance Settlement Association, Darwin Baston. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician in Innsmark. Let's get down to business. Welcome to the show, Darren. Thank you. Well, I want to say, if you didn't see yesterday's show, you need to go back out because Darren and I kind of gave you the kind of the update where we've come from since the 2008 debacle and the market meltdown. I, I see this now as a legitimate tool. Most agents, good agents, good advisors do audits. They do the audits of their money under management. They do their audits of their life insurance, their annuities. They look at the policies every year to make sure that they're doing what they, we said they were going to do to make sure the strategies and tactics that we employed and insert into our clients overall plan are working and they're still in vogue. They're still current need. And when we're looking at this, many times we find out, oh, uh, and one of the biggest markets I've seen right now is when the Merrill Deduction Act went north of 10 million, I'm looking at a ton of single and second to die contracts that are in irrevocable life insurance trusts that are sitting there. People are going, well, what do I do with this now? Well, some people have decided, well, I'm going to gift it away. Some people yeah. said, well, I'm going to reduce the death benefit and just let the cash pay for it and just keep it online. Whatever it is, I'll give it to my kids or grandkids. But a lot of people are saying, gee, I really don't need this. I don't want to pay the premiums anymore. I'm wondering if I can get some money out of that. That's what, and I'm just thinking of one market. I'm just giving you one. So when we do this, I'm thinking, how did we come to this? Because right now we've, we really have, we're walking through the regulatory market of this. This is what we want to talk about today. We're talking about the foundation, how the government looks at this. Mm -hmm. I would like you to talk about this so that everybody feels comfortable about selling life, ins uh, life insurance settlements and how they could be a big boom for seniors who are desperate. For, a lot of them are desperate for cash and don't need the money. And by the way, a little heads up. Uh, remember, I'm always wanting to talk to the beneficiaries before we do anything. Yep. so that everybody's right. online. So tell me about the Supreme Court action. You know, this, this, this was kind of a, an interesting idea. Well, in 1911, the United States Supreme Court made, a, made a, a decision with regards to a case related to life insurance policy that said effectively that the life insurance policy was personal property. In other words, it gave it the characteristics of other personal property and therefore allowed it to be sold for value. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so that really is the basis for actually a life insurance settlement to take place. Now, it stayed dormant for a mm -hmm. lot, a lot of years, and so we didn't hear much about it then until the markets uh, began to think about these uh, in the context of in the 1990s and 2000s. Well, I think one of the things that really spurred this whole life settlement was, you know, the original viatical settlements were really based on, you know, the issues like I'm selling imminent death policies here. I look, went to my doctor, he says I have 18 months to live. Right. And that, uh, the viatical not only uh, gave birth to the life settlement market, but it actually, a lot of carriers actually started putting riders in their own policies saying, hey, if you, if you go coming back with an imminent death warrant on your life from your physician, sure. we'll go ahead and accelerate the benefit. Oh, absolutely. So, so this, that viatical changed uh, not only the riders that we place on life insurance, but it also actually gave birth pretty much to the life settlement market. Well, it did. It, it was a tremendous benefit for those people who are HIV uh, uh, and, and AIDS patients who, who badly needed uh, some mm -hmm. resources, whether it was for treatment or whether it's to, to have a few mm -hmm. months of, of, of a better life. But uh, of course, when uh, in, in the mid 1990s or whenever, whenever the cocktail came along, so to speak, and the medications improved, uh, that market went away mm -hmm. because those policies were valued based upon the fact that people were going to live two years, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. they were living mm -hmm. uh, indefinitely. So that became a disease where it didn't uh, bring death, but it's just something that people live with. Well, I think one of the issues that we're always going to debate is, you know, the personal property, the, 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 the federal courts have ruled on it, so there's yes. not a question here. And I think most attorneys that deal in the estate market, probate market, they understand that as well. They're, they're there on that. Our issues are generally, we have carriers... They, they, we always want to write, we, were, we originally wrote these contracts with insurance justification in mind. We could justify it. We had economic loss if it occurred. We know why we were indemnifying a client, whether it was a business partner or a family member. That was all good, and we understand that. I think people that were actually, when we got a little ahead of ourselves and we started selling life insurance settlements for the sake of settlements and, and selling or trying to turn it in two years, I think those, uh, that little sector of our market was the dark side. And I think that's all been eliminated. Pretty much people are away from that market. Now we're looking at legitimate cases under the law, personal property, and using this as a standalone asset. And I, I'm, I'm kind of at a new place now. 
I just filled out a net worth statement for a client and I looked at that number and I bid his cl his case out so that I could actually value it above the cash values. Yes. Yeah. Because that actually is what it's worth on the open market and then gave the bid as a copy underneath the net worth statement. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we're all in a sort of a new beginning here now. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a lot of changes since 2008, and now we simply have a marketplace where you have a lot of consumers who are in a lot of need of financial assistance. You have investors who understand this better. Mm -hmm. And I think now we look at, let's look at a, where are we today, mm -hmm. and we're looking forward as something almost to, not totally new, mm -hmm. but the foundations were there. But it's a completely different approach to it. Well, I could say, and I hope you don't mind me saying, I think I want to push the reset button then. <laughs> you know, on the whole market. Just, we're starting over again. Exactly. With good faith and new resolve. I think that's correct. I think that's correct. And I think the secondary market, and certainly our role within mm -hmm. that secondary market as an association, is to try to make a market that has integrity, and it's built on the concept of trust. And we all know that trust can be, you know, you, you do a tremendous amount with trust, by simply having a lot of transparency and a lot of disclosure. And a lot of those things mm -hmm. are in the marketplace today that weren't there. So therefore, consumers can feel a lot more comfortable that they're in a marketplace where uh, they can sell a product uh, in, in a market that's got credibility. When we come back from the break, we're going to continue with Darwin. We're going to talk about a little bit more of the development of the life settlement. Let's give you a little history on it so that you understand where we've come from and why now we've kind of started brand new. We'll be right back after the break. It's not how much money you make for your clients, it's how much money they get to keep, especially in retirement. But retirement income could cause Social Security benefits to be taxed. One tax advantage alternative is life insurance designed as a non-modified endowment contract that can generate tax-free income without taxing Social Security benefits. These contracts offer differing funding options depending upon your client's risk tolerance. For more information on how life insurance can be part of your retirement planning, just email me at steve at downtobusiness.tv Brought to you by Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back to our second segment. Of course, I'm with President and CEO of the Life Insurance Settlement Association, Darwin Basin. Darwin, when I'm looking at the history, we gave a little bit. We touched on the HIV and the AIDS yeah. uh, issues in the 90s. In the early 2000s, we had this beginning of senior settlements. It, you know, all of a sudden... You want to remember, there's so much elder care law out on the street right now, and we want to protect our seniors from scams and things Correct. of this nature. And I don't want to have our area of life insurance settlement, you know, put into that same area where we have to be so watchdog. So we have to take a proactive approach from an association point of view and an industry point of view. When we're looking at this, I'm looking at institutions. We have foreign people in our market looking at this issue. Mm -hmm. Because really, and, I, and I, I hope this is okay to say it like this, this is a non-correlated market asset. You know, this isn't correlated to the stocks up, bonds down. Correct. This is pretty much a non-correlated asset. And it has some tax play here, too. It could have some tax play. Right. So I want to be able to speak about this intelligently. Talk to me about in the early 2000s. Why don't you walk us through that little bit of history? Well, in the early 2000s, when you really started the beginnings of, well, the, first of all, we had the ending of the biotical market. Mm -hmm. uh, and people began to think about, well, wouldn't this be good for seniors? Mm -hmm. And so that's when that development first kind of started, the whole idea of, well, this makes some sense. So, you, But you have to figure mm -hmm. out all of the moving parts. A life settlement mm -hmm. contract is not that rocket science complicated. I mean, you have a, you have a, a policy that you know what the death benefit is you know what the premiums are. They may change mm -hmm. over time, and you may not know exactly that particular part of it, but you also, the biggest factor is you don't know how long these people are going to live. So you began the real rudiments of that coming together, which I don't want to use the wrong term here, but it's almost like crude finance, mm -hmm. you know, elementary finance, the way, the way it started. And that began to build up over time uh, until we got to the mid-2000s, where there was a lot of activity going on, and then all of a sudden uh, there was a discovery out there about this business of premium finance. Mm -hmm. You can get premium financed insurance. Well, I, and, I, I remember that day because, I, and I don't mean to interrupt, but that was really a major play because we were already doing premium finance for big second die cases, correct? Already doing it. So was it logical to come into our buy policies using premium finance? and hoping that the actual timeline and death benefit play would be better in its long run against borrowing the money and sure. paying an interest charge. That really, that, that pushed it up quite extensively. I mean, you, you shot me a number here that's well over $10 billion. Right. 
That, that's I mean, in face value, I mean, just because we were able to bring in financing, it just accelerated everything. I think so. I think the basic idea was it was supposed to be a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, it was supposed to be a win for the customer because they could, get, they could buy insurance mm -hmm. and get a finance the other ordinarily wouldn't be able to do. It was supposed to be a win for the, uh, you know, for the agent that was, was selling the policy to them. It was a win for the insurance companies because they get to offer another, uh, they get the, you know, they got another policy out there. And it was supposed to be a win for the person mm -hmm. because at some time in the future, they, they were supposed to be able to sell that policy for more than what was due on it from the, from the mm -hmm. premium financing. And so it would be a win-win for everybody. Mm -hmm. But it ended up not being so. No, I mean, one of the things is, and I, and, and I think most people have really stepped aside from non-recourse loans. Correct. I think we've pushed away from that. And we're just trying to do value for value. The, the investor comes in, he's not going to be leveraging it on a loan anymore. Well, there might be some out there, but, but just the, most of the mainstream players in the secondary and tertiary market, right. pretty much in that vein. Um, but now, when we got to 2008 now, we had this huge meltdown. Correct. And all of a sudden, money dried up. It just did. Yes. Hedge funds dried up. And all of a sudden, we just did not have any money for this, and everybody was pulling back. And right at the time we have the market meltdown, I have what I call the secondary meltdown, which is life expectancy reports that were way too short that should have been much longer. Well, that's exactly right. You brought up the two components that really caused the market to do what it did in 2008. When you extended life expectancies, the math simply didn't work out anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, the person who bought the policy was going to have to pay premiums for a longer period of time, and they were going to wait for their money, and the returns just weren't going to be there. So that market just, mm -hmm. you know, caved in, aside from the fact that there weren't investors who were at that point in time willing to put their money on the line because of the great uncertainties involved in knowing what they were, were getting into. I, I think when we see our market today, we know we have funders and investors out there. We have, a, I think, a better handle, a better handle on life expectancy. And I think when we're looking at this now, we also can, I, I, and I tend to be of the more mid-range uh, investor here, where I yeah. don't want to tell the guy, I don't want to tell anybody we're, we're turning this in 60 months, like a lot, yeah. many of our predecessors said. Right. I think we're really looking at it, you know, if I'm looking at around 10 years and beyond, I think I'm looking at a reasonable number with a reasonable rate of return, much like a zero coupon bond, if I may use the allegory. And I think that's where I see this market going. I think it's better for us to be a little bit more conservative now. We've grown, we've evolved, we've matured, That's hopefully, right. right? That's right. And so we're really we're ready to come back into the market with a really good game plan. And I see this, as you've said, one of the greatest is this is a rescue. This could be a rescue plan for many seniors. This could be the backstop cash that they've been looking for. This is absolutely the backstop. This is a safety net that many of them are going to have uh, during the, re the retirement years. And, and given the marketplace and how it's changed, uh, all the way from the way it's regulated to, to everyone's realization that uh, these uh, returns, when you talk about returns to, to institutional investors of 15, 20, 25 percent uh, for something that they may buy and hold long term, mm -hmm. and buying for its investment value, it seems to be unrealistic. So I think mm -hmm. the expectations today are a lot more reasonable in terms of what they're going to get on this investment if they buy it and hold it for longer term. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Remember, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always consult your tax advisor and legal counsel or your broker dealer compliance officer. Missed an episode? Just go out to our site, downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. Want to email me? Just write me, steve at downtobusiness.tv. And remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage advisor. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you.